What's up? Sumo day. Sumo deadlift. How to sumo deadlift. My second sumo deadlift in six months. I'm going to smash big weights. If you want sumo deadlift tips, stay tuned. Give this thing a thumbs up. We're digging in. We're at two plates and we're just going to keep chipping. What's your first tip for us? I think the biggest thing overall is for people to stop focusing on other lifters and cues and start to feel sensation. Something I do and we've done another video on it is like kind of a control the eccentric with a lot of my reps because it kind of puts you in a place and you'll feel your starting position better, which is obviously all that matters here. Like starting position, how you start is how you're going to finish. It's a little bit different than the other lifts where we're starting from a static and we're starting from the ground, right? We have a concentric, a way up only, not a way down, like a squat or a bench. So the starting position is going to matter most. I hear a lot of people talk about like wedging and pulling the slack and all these are like terms and cues, but if you don't have the right sensation for them, you didn't miss that RPE 9 because your wedging was off. You missed that RPE 9 because you weren't feeling the right way or that cue doesn't connect with you, which is fine. Those are just like two cues that everyone uses. Doesn't mean it's working in your brain. With wedging itself and pulling the slack, with your, which are similar, right? Slack, typically people are talking about the bar, we're talking about the external and getting all the slack out of our arms, using these as ropes and getting tension into the bar, right? So if you're watching from the side, you see like arms are straight, I can do all this, but as soon as I start to move, we get it out of the bar too. Right? So now things are moving. And opposite, the wedging, I actually think people speak of it wrong where we're getting our hips to the proper height and also getting your hips close to the bar, which is true, but that's also just in relation to having your hips way back. I actually never have once thought about getting my hips close to the bar and it's not a cue I use often because I think most people, when they do that, they'll tend to curl their hip. A lot of us think of our hips up here, you know? We're like, uh, when we're talking about our hips, we're talking here. So if you say get close to the bar, people automatically kind of go like this. You know, I don't know if it's an evolution fertility thing. So everyone's thinking right here. But when you want your hips to the bar, close to the bar, it's actually here. And this stays neutral and packed. It's not here. But most people do this. And now we're pulling from here. Once you get above 90%, a couple people do it and get away with it. But now I have to uncurl all this under load to lock it out. Other than if I'm here and I just get my hips closer with that slack out, now all I have to do is stand up. I'm already locked out. Abby, even, who's a very good lifter, commented on how my quads snap so quick. It's because once I snap my quads, when I get to the sumo to my knee, it's locked out. It's already done. And I got a long range. I'm locking up here by my little two inch pee pee. I'm locking way the fuck up here. If I was locking out down here, it'd be over for you fellas. Because I'm already so locked in when I'm here. And my shit does look a little bit more of a conventional, but that's just because I got stubby arms, long torso, stubby thighs, so I, I, can't, I can't get here. It's literally impossible because I, ca I can't get to the bar, right? But if you're all packed in, you pull that slack out, yeah, I'm kind of getting my hips close to the bar, but I'm also just thinking to get my hips in the right spot where I feel this tension, the sensation again. And I'm just gonna snap. And again, once I snap my quads, look, I'm already locked out. Now I just kind of lean back. Rather than if you're here and you get this curl going, now I'm here and now I got a whole nother lift. <laughs> Use my erectors to kind of pull the rest of it out. So what's your take on the whole hug grip situation? We talked about it for a sec on a uh, podcast. Yeah. yeah. Obviously there's not like pure science on it. So I just look like broad anecdotal, anecdotal surveys. And so when I'm looking at things, it's like, all right, how many people are breaking world records or winning powerlifting meets hook grip? Is every single person that's winning this game going hook grip? No. Nah. So uh, I think it's Joe, right? Is Joe the one fucking stirring the pot? God damn it, Joe. Uh, he says it's overrated. Yeah. I would agree. Hook grip is overrated. Um, I think it's a great piece. Everyone's always worried about their biceps, but like if you pull correctly and you're not running a bunch of gear, the chances of, of busting your bicep are like, they're there, they're there, but they're low. I mean, you can bust your bicep bench and you can bust your pec bench and you know, all these things are possible, but it's not as, as high of a chance as people think. As long as you're not like super exposed here, like just flex your tricep. Same would probably be with hook grip. You're just less likely to flex your tri uh, bicep. You can, you can bust a bicep doing that too. There's no, no law that says you can't. In terms of pure grip, there's a lot of big lifters missing their grip at the top. And I'm not saying that they would lift better with mixed grip, but it's just an anecdote that says, okay, mixed grip is 100% valid, if not more valid than a hook grip. Hook grip got popular. I don't even know why. Obviously, Olympic weightlifters do it and they have to do it. They can't underhand it because they have to catch it on their shoulders, although I have seen people do that. And when you do a continental press, you do that, 
or Continental Clean. Um, but yeah, I would agree, it's probably overrated. I've messed with it and I've pulled up to like 500 that way. I obviously don't compete, so I just lift with straps and, and don't care and feel great about it. So I think maybe, you know, obviously do what you, you feel comfortable and do what you gotta do. I even love some double overhand work, non-hook grip, non-mix grip. If you're talking about lighter weights or RDLs or anything of that nature, I think too many people are, are going a little bit crazy with the straps, hook grip only, doing rows with straps and stuff like that. I, I am a fan of, of doing all my accessories, no straps as much as I can. Obviously I'm not a bodybuilder, but I think there's something to get your grip going. But for most folks, man, choose a grip that's comfy, play around with both of them. I don't think the imbalances in your back or hurricane in at the top of your lift is as drastic as people talk about. What would you say is the optimal foot placement? Yeah, so I think that's another thing people talk about when, when they're talking about bench, squat, any lift, all people think about is range of motion, which is like one tiny factor in the big picture of this. I've known benchers, look at Kirill, dude on the world record bench for the longest time, 6'8", wingspan, right? Like, and he's not, like, yeah, he's probably pretty maximal grip, but his stroke is so long. Um, Eric's photo's a little bit more looking like a bencher, but not even that, like his arms are like, 25 inches big so like it just looks like he's built like that so range of motion is one small piece if it wasn't everyone would pull sumo more and they don't everyone would go max grip bench they don't everyone would squat wide they don't when i'm thinking about someone's stance in the sumo deadlift how to optimize it rather than where to start or how to begin um, we're trying to get our knee kind of over our midfoot and there's anecdotes that other people are wider, right? Now my knee's over my ankle and they really cut that range and they're really mobile and they can pull big weights. But most people are gonna be probably strongest when they can kind of get this knee right over that ankle or right over my midfoot. This is where I feel really, really strong. It's kind of the sim similar angle that we're jumping with. I know your little knee over toes zealots are gonna talk about it. But yes, my knees can go over my toes, but this isn't how I jump. You ever play a basketball game, you ain't jumping like this. We're gonna get right about here and I'm gonna lay out from right here. And that's kind of where I want to get in this range. So too wide for me. I got kind of short femurs. Now I'm inside here. Plus I can't open up enough to get me close to the bar. So that's why my stance, people have always called it like a frog stance or a semi sumo. Sumo is when your hands are inside your knees. Conventional is when your hands are outside your knees. I don't give a shit about the semantics. Mine looks small because I got short ass arms and short femurs. So I must get here to even get into a decent place with the bar. I could try to get way out here, but now I got no leverage in my quads. And again, sumo deadlift has a lot to do with quad strength, starting position, and quad strength. Is there a reason why you were doing conventional? What's funny is like people watch the vlogs or my Instagram in different time zones or like different areas of my life. And like some people don't know that like I pulled my biggest weight sumo. Some people think I only conventional. So they're like, are you gonna try sumo ever? Why don't you pull the sumo? And then other people will be the opposite. Like, are you ever gonna pull sumo again and actually power lift? I pull conventional, I think, because it's easier. I think uh, my back's really strong and I can just handle more load long-term. Seabass asked if it's because I'm old now. Some of that's like a little true. Like, it's a little harsher on my hips to pull sumo. I don't ever really have hamstring, glute, low back stuff. So conventional, like, feels good. But kind of opening up in the sumo, I'm just not that mobile. So it makes my hips a little angry if I do a lot of volume. That's why today we just did a top set double and then all my volume I'll catch conventional. Which will lead us to the next thing. We'll talk a little bit about variations, overhyped ones, overrated ones, and uh, the general topic of accessories and how they're highly overrated for strength athletes. The idea of GPP has been so driven home by Westside Barbell. And Westside Barbell, Conjugate Method, Louis Simmons have a lot of contributions to the strength and conditioning world and a huge contribution to the powerlifting world. But I think it gets misinterpreted when you represent it in a raw powerlifting um, atmosphere. And that's where we are. So like my number one variations are simple. Maybe a block, maybe some chains. So I continue to make progress. There's no secret about chains, but it's just a variation. Beltless, paused, and that's kind of the end of it. Um, you don't need a lot of ball automatic sauce. You need to lift weights, light weights with perfect form, medium weights really fast for reps, and heavy weights as clean as you can. And mix those up in a pot and you get stronger over time. I think frequency in the deadlift is underrated. So pulling twice a week, there is some studies and stuff that shows that your, the, 
overall systemic fatigue and your CNS being fried is the same on a squat and deadlift. People maybe feel it more on the deadlift because the absolute load that beginners tend to pull is much larger in poundage than the beginner's squat, right? It's very common to see a beginner that can crank out a 500 pound pull, barely squats 315 or 365. As you get more advanced, different, um, obviously muscle fibers, genetics, and leverages play more of an account, but though we see that gap tend to close unless they're like a specialist, but even then, the CNS fatigue or being fried from deadlifts is purely because you're lifting 500 pounds versus 315. It's not the movement itself. Long story short, deadlifting two twice a week, a heavier day, a medium day, a light day, is all great ideas as well. Stiff leg deadlifts or RDLs, beltless, pause, all these things force us to use less weight than we can. Again, we're just managing fatigue but still getting a hip hinge and building muscle. In terms of pure accessory, something that's not a variation of the lift, again, kind of overrated but Having bigger hamstrings, bigger glutes, and bigger back will never hurt in the long run. I think chin-ups, rows, RDL, GHRs, there's a million exercises. It doesn't really matter. However you feel good to push yourself near failure a couple times a week, handling good food and sleep, you'll build muscle in, those, in your posterior, and that's all that really matters. What's your opinion on rag pulls? I still just don't understand them. Uh, if you have access to blocks, there's, for hypertrophy, strength, there's no reason to ever rack pull. It's actually the most, if we had to make one useless movement, it's literally useless because you get the exact same thing from a block pull, but you're not gonna ruin equipment and be all weird. And the tension on the bar is different, so might as well get into a block pull. Stop cutting for a second, right? You just went straight maintenance. I'm like half and half. I'm still not consistent with that because like, I buy groceries already to my diet. You know what I mean? So like, I'm still kind of stuck in a, not a deficit, but like just not eating enough. I had a burrito last night, so a little bit of carbs. And we're only a week past when we had like our cheat meal, even though like if you counted, I probably didn't eat that many calories, really. Like I definitely had above uh, maintenance, but we didn't go that crazy, we got full. Like check out Barber Brigade's channel and we got a vlog here. So yeah, I just didn't eat as much as I thought. So I'll probably take another week and find maintenance. Then I'm hopefully going on a little vacay. And so then there, I'll probably just not track, but focus on protein. I don't want to go crazy. And then when I come back, October, we'll find like real maintenance probably. And so training will feel all right. The training feels good right now. I get a little pump. I took yesterday off just because I was so busy with errands and shit. We got our meet here tomorrow. And then I, just, I got weddings coming up. And just a bunch of you know, the next clothing launch, et cetera, et cetera. So just a little too busy to train yesterday. I ran around, but feeling good. Yeah, but once I get to real maintenance, I think I'll feel really good. If I can lock it in and sit at like 193, that's what I was today, then I think I'll feel really good. So I'll be able to catch a pump. I'll be able to add volume into my training and not really worry about it. Um, hope you guys like this style of video. Leave your comments below what topic you want us to cover next. Today is obviously sumo deadlift talk, but we can go into anything. Building muscle, bench, overhead. I'm down. We're here to help you. A little more vloggy style mixed with the education. Appreciate you guys. 3SB.co. New videos twice a week. I appreciate you catching the next one.